pretty full program for today. The uh, main thing that I want to do is, that I want to get to, is comparing the weird kind of clustering and beating properties of the, these molecules that uh, have their rotor doing some very fancy quantum mechanics and connect that to what we've already discussed about the uh, much simpler D3 and D6 uh, bands, the frequency bands that are there. Now, a lot of this involves correlation of uh, symmetry representation. So uh, we're going to be, for the first time, really looking um, at the detail of the octahedral uh, symmetries and tetrahedral symmetries that these uh, molecules uh, have. And that's a full three-dimensional, very non-abelian uh, algebra and symmetry. And so I want to make sure we uh, get the nomenclature that's most commonly used to describe both the groups and uh, their representations, all the while being, taking advantage of a little slide rule, is that cube that you uh, already seen um, that lets us do products and make cosets and all that kind of stuff that we'll need later. But uh, we do need the character tables of these, and we've done a top-down approach, which gave us the character table of the O group. So we're going to rush through that. Um, there'll be a link uh, to the step-by-step -step production of the uh, uh, minimal equations and the central um, that's the all commuting uh, projectors and then finally the characters. So this part will go uh, pretty quickly, but I do want to spend a good deal of time looking at how we use the characters and I, I don't want to uh, take advantage of the representations of these groups uh, in this lecture. We're going to do that in the next one. I wanted to split those two. And part of the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of people that if you're in this field that you'll talk to that really only know character theory. That's, that's the gr only group theory they know, and they have rote methods of using it. And that's kind of the, it. And then the rest of the time, it's in the lab getting the lasers to work. So you can excuse them for this, certainly, because it takes a lot of time in order to do more than just a rote uh, approach to the projections and characters. So we're, we're going to go through doing sort of the minimum amount of uh, higher mathematics as, as goes to making these correlations between big groups and lesser groups like D4 and the smallest one uh, in the case of the tetragonal stuff that we'll do is C4. So uh, let's go ahead here and I say I have a review here. I'm going to uh, go through this because I really should have done this before. It took me a while to find uh, a particular uh, well-written description of the uh, irreducible representation frequency formula. So I'm going to uh, leave that as a link. This is a link uh, to that that uh, existed in a uh, lecture back in 2015. So let's go ahead uh, and just quickly uh, remember that we have all these uh, things and uh, TC has updated this so that it has pretty much 100 percent, but you can't tell because I haven't checked every one of them in detail, but uh, we're getting there. Um, right now, just the idea of having a formula uh, for uh, the all commuting projectors, the ones that are uh, in uh, character terms, uh, where the uh, all commuting projector is related to the all commuting class sums and then vice versa. That's absolutely essential uh, for doing character analysis. And most of the people that you'll, you'll talk to at um, uh, the conferences on atomic and molecular uh, will uh, have foggy uh, notions of this. They have a, a rote method of kind of avoiding uh, that uh, uh, algebra. We really need it for doing these uh, uh, induced representations, coset spaces, and all that that we really need for the really fancy stuff. Uh, at the end of this lecture and then the next one. So um, here's the, the deal here. The first thing is to get P in terms of the classes, and that uh, is based on these characters. They're uh, a sum of the diagonal elements 
So we make use of that using the, our, our vial expansions and uh, our uh, uh, assumed uh, splitting into irreducible projectors. That's uh, the whole reason for getting the all commuting projectors, the class projectors. And the, uh, the irreducible representation projectors have already, in the last lecture, been given uh, as a, a formula uh, involving a sum over what we like to think of it as a wave function for all the different positions that might exist that can be accessed by a group operator. And then this dimension over order of group uh, shows up uh, there. So this is the vial expansion. You can, these are links uh, that uh, take you back to that if you're reading this for the, uh, you know, pleasure <laughs> and learning. So uh, that uh, is a part of it. So that makes this all commuting um, projector B written very nicely as a sum of characters with the L mu over G and then uh, it's a sum over all of the G. But you'd like to write that as a class sum and that's pretty easy to do you see because the character as a function of group element uh, will not be changed if you take a group element that's in the same class. That means it's a group element that's obtained by transformation four and aft by another group element in that uh, group. So that makes this formula uh, pretty obvious uh, at that, that point. Um, but it, when you go to do the thing in reverse, that is get the classes in terms of the uh, projectors, uh, we're now using the ultimate uh, expansion. It's surprising how few people that use group theory know this thing, but it's so fundamental. It's just telling me I've got a bunch of placeholder matrices, P, U, M, N, and uh, those placeholder matrices, I'm going to go ahead and advance on this thing so we're talking about the same thing. Those placeholder M, Ns uh, are the, uh, each holding one of these things, one of these numbers, uh, the irreducible representation components, off-diagonal, mostly on-diagonal uh, as well. So. We're here asking about the, only the diagonal of these matrices to make the formulas that appear. So the basic idea is that this uh, representation uh, of a class, and the class should commute with everything in the group, including one of these placeholders. Okay, so having that commute with a, a, a projector, a placeholder, uh, gives you uh, a, a relationship that is uh, well, first of all, because of this, it's telling me that the only non-zero element uh, of this projector in the representation uh, that it's supposed to belong to is the one where m is equal to p, n is equal to r, and while we're at it, we should mention it would better be the same representation as the projector. That's obviously zero. But th this is a, a very obvious uh, delta function formula that tells you uh, uh, that this is a, a number that goes with a one placeholder uh, at a time. So here I go saying I've got a commutation. I say that this uh, has to be a representation of this algebra and this has to commute with this thing. This is not all commuting, but this is. So it could be on this side or that side. And then uh, we go ahead and we notice that the placeholder relationship here gives two delta functions. The placeholder there gives it another two. And so I, uh, what it's telling me is I sum over B here, I better uh, stop at P and use no other number than that. And the same thing over here, I better stop when uh, D is equal to R. So you end up with a kind of a weird equation, which is this one uh, right here, which becomes this one. So th this is, this is kind of neat because uh, basically what it's saying is, well, uh, yeah, this will work, but then the representation of a class has to be diagonal, and it always has to be equal. Every one of the diagonal elements has to be equal. So this is really a key matrix result, and this is a funny way to get it. If you look in most group theory, they have a really complicated sort of uh, esoteric, how did they ever think of that? a way to prove what is Schur's lemma. Schur's lemma, it, Schur's lemma is that uh, the only thing that commutes with every irreducible representation uh, element is a multiple uh, with a dimension of that matrix representation of the unit element. In other words, every unit operates, the only thing commutes with an irreducible representation 
uh, for all of the elements that it can represent. So that gives you uh, this very simple uh, result here, which the, you, you then uh, can use to finish this whole thing. And so this is the result here, the character is the really kind of weird combination of the all commuting uh, projectors. So we've gotten a long way here without using this, and we'll get through today without using this, but I think you should be aware that this is there. So the order of the class over the dimension, where this one is the dimension over the order of the group. And then you have a character here, you have a character star here if you're using complex representations. Don't forget to put the star in when you're doing a projector and the D is the wave function. The wave function is always the complex conjugate of the representation of the operators that generate everything we're doing. Okay, so these are a couple of messages that I wanted you to get uh, across but you can go back and uh, look at this on your own time. And then also use this, use this uh, uh, for a more complicated character analysis that we'll be uh, having to do. And just to check that, I guess I've, I've already kind of checked it, but I want to check this link right here uh, to that. This is the derivation of the frequency uh, formula. So if you've got a representation, uh, I don't care where you got it, it can be as big as a parking lot, if it represents your group, then you should be able to find the number of each of the irreducible representations that make it up using this formula right here. How many of the E1s are there? So you've got to get the character of the E1, you've got to get the orders of the classes that go with your symmetry, whatever it is and sum and divide uh, uh, by the order of this, uh, whatever the group is. That uh, In this case, I'm imagining it's a subgroup, and that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be taking the octahedral group and using various of its subgroups uh, to see how uh, the irreducible representation of the whole group crush is it's crushable once you talk about just a small subset, that subgroup of elements of the octahedral group. This will all, uh, I think, may be clear uh, later on. Okay, um, now uh, let's go ahead here and uh, just go through the zoo of groups, basically, and pick out uh, the, elm the groups that are most important uh, for um, doing either solid state physics or molecular physics. Uh, there's, it's a pretty small number, and that's what I would like to point out right here, is that to do all of these groups, and there's 32 of these suckers here, 16 of them actually indicated on this figure, and then in chapter 2 there's another figure just like it, except I draw pictures of the abelian groups. There's 16 abelian groups indicated by the little circles in this drawing, and then there are 16 non-abelian groups. Together, those are the only 32 symmetries that we have discovered for a crystal lattice. That's kind of um, interesting, and I pointed out how you prove that using a, the uh, character uh, 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 formula. So, um, you know, some of the things aren't following quite the logical order they should, but anyway, we do the best we can. So, three groups out of this. O, that's the one we're going to learn today, D3, and then D4, the one I told you you ought to do just to show that you can manipulate the algebra we uh, did to get D3. Okay? No D5. Oh, there is a D6. Actually, a D6H of order tw uh, 24 right here. Same order as the group we're going to work with today, which is the octahedral group. Okay? But of orders uh, uh, 12, D6, that's the one we got the other uh, last time was the D3 cross C2 uh, sort of cross product, right? So that made us 12 elements, okay. So we're working with the big guys today. But this one is derivable. You under, if you know what this one is, and C2 is no problem, right? C3 is no problem. Uh, if you've got those guys down, the time, I'm sure you do have that, the abelian guys, cyclic groups then everything here is isomorphic to either these three or products involving them and cyclics, okay? 
So we're, we're doing the biggest of the group today by a long shot. Okay, so we got to pay attention to this. This is not trivial. Okay. And it's also connected with a whole bunch of other things like the permutation of four things, which is the, the real doorway to the whole um, symmetry of symmetry. That is, if you're going to do unitary groups of order in, uh, the permutation group of order in is at the is a subgroup of that, an important one. Okay, cube, octahedron, replace faces, face centers with points, right? These are conjugate regular polytopes. And the, the question is, how many operations are there? Well, first you just figure out how many positions uh, this thing can be in that symmetry allows. In other words, if it was an unmarked octahedron, how many different ways could you put it so that somebody would turn their head while you changed it, and you come back, nothing's changed. Okay, that's the basic idea. So uh, uh, the order of the octahedron is either thought of as six hexahedron squares. Oh, hexahedron is a big name for a cube. Okay, uh, times the four points of that uh, square. Okay, so we're looking at this guy, and we just multiply. Uh, the six faces by the four ways those faces could be is 24. Or we look at the octahedron's faces, it's triangles, okay? You've got eight of those octa uh, times three points, again, 24. And finally, you've got uh, a whole bunch of lines. Well, you've got exactly 12 lines uh, on either of these uh, objects here. Uh, multiply that by two, and you've got 24, okay? So this is uh, the 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 primer, before you even consider groups as having operations, uh, you're just uh, not uh, you're thinking about positions that those operations can achieve. So th th that's what we're doing very at the very first. And if you're going to deal with four, five, six dimensional objects, this type of argument uh, is, is uh, the first thing that you would uh, try uh, uh, to get an insight into that. Now, Putting four numbers, one, two, three, and four, on an octahedron in, in just that way, uh, you can see very obviously that the permutation four is at least relevant. Four factorial is also 24. So that's the idea. But now, the operations, that's what we deal with. Uh, the positions come from the operations. So we think of the operations as the uh, as a way of obtaining uh, a Hamiltonian matrix for uh, either quantum mechanics or uh, even classical. We'll be doing some modes of SF6 using uh, this sort of uh, analysis. So first there's the class of one. Okay, poor little lonely guy. Okay, so that's the first class. And that group, every group has one of those. And there's a, are all by the lonely cells in that class. And then comes, this is the class of eight. This is a pretty big class. This is the biggest class that uh, exists in the octahedral group. They're, there's, a, uh, as you can see, eight faces, and every one of those faces has a 120-degree rotation associated with it. So um, those are the names that we give them. Little r, the one, uh, as in the 1-1 one, one direction, and there's a Cartesian coordinate system associated with the next two classes that we might as well take a look at. First of all, the class of three. 180-degree rotations around 100 zero, zero axes, or 010 zero, zero, or 001, zero, zero, x, y, and z. So I normally put the x-axis here, and the y-axis here, and then the z-axis points at you. That's uh, all the pictures, pretty much all the pictures will, will show are of, of that uh, order. Okay, so 1 means x, 2 means y, and 3 means z in this guy. We're going to name them... This is the modern notation that goes on that little cubic slide rule, or the big one in the side of the room there. Uh, row uh, x, y, and z is this class of three. Okay, so we've got little r and little Greek r, uh, and that together is a subgroup right there. It's called the T group, tetrahedral symmetry, which is a weird symmetry. We're going to see some more about that in a minute. But then we fill out the rest of the group with two classes of six. This class of six has got plus and minus 90 degree rotations. And you can see I'm using R1 
uh, and here was R1 squared. So uh, we're, we use um, for R cubed, that's the inverse of R1, just as R squared here is, R, R2 squared is the inverse of R2, and R1 has an R1 squared hiding uh, behind there, and so forth. We do the same thing here. We call this R1, and then this is R1 inverse, which is the same as R1 cubed. These R's, each axis, form a C4 subgroup, which we're going to play with mightily uh, today. But to keep things simple, I use R tilde uh, for the inverse guys. I don't put another exponent up there or a minus one on those uh, slide rule notations. Okay, uh, this by itself is not a group. We need six more. And those are the 180 degree rotations around the edges. So this 12 lines here, there's 12 uh, operations if you were to count I3 uh, squared as its inverse, but for classical groups and uh, uh, boson uh, systems, we don't have that. We'll get in a little bit of the spinner stuff today, but mostly we're going to be working with uh, uh, that as six elements, uh, 180 each one of them. And so 180 is going to be the inverse of 100 minus 180 uh, and vice versa. So these are all on one one zero diagonals. These two are all on one zero zero type axes, both of these. And uh, then these are the one 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 with different signs, the possibility of different signs. Okay, exactly six, eight possibilities for different signs. Two choices for three things. Two to the third power is eight. Okay? So this is a little bit of the numerology that's associated with this group. This, these are things to help you, uh, you know, think about it, and uh, uh, we're going to have to do a lot with that. Yeah. Uh, why might the rotation, for example, is like 180, if you have like that threefold symmetry, to me, naturally, mm -hmm. I would think it would be 120. Well, you've got all your 120 tied up in this class. Oh, oh. All oh, of them. Yeah. Every bit That's, of is uh, in this class of eight. Okay. Oh, I didn't, I thought, like, those are around the edges, right? Yeah, whenever you see a line here, it means there's going to be some kind of rotation around it. Okay. Yeah, I thought, I thought, I saw, like, uh, and the line was coming from the center of the, one of the faces of the octahedron. Yeah, that's that, that's that class all of 120 yeah. rotations. Okay. Um, maybe you were looking at that guy, but he's really coming opposite to this. That's the z-axis, number three, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's number x, one, and the two is up, according to my way of setting coordinates for the drawing, right? Yeah, I see. Then I all see the rest of these are go all the way through and sit tangent to a square that cuts the octahedron in half, right? So those are the, for example, those would be the 280 degree rotations, I5 and I6, four, a square that came out of the x-axis, perpendicular, perpendicular to the square, perpendicular to the x-axis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we've got lots of cubes here which we can uh, share with you uh, to help uh, with this. And that's particularly important because that's one of the things I'm going to show here next is the cube. Okay, This is half the cube, though. Uh, until the, later in this uh, thing, but midway and past, I'm going to put in the other half of the OH group. But this is all 24 right here. Okay? All 24 of these operators. There's one place for each of them. Those are the way you label states or positions with group operator. So when I say I've got a wave in I6, I mean, I've got a wave in this little triangle here of some shape, right? And that's what we're after. Also, uh, we're going to be talking about cosets. Each one of these planes gives you the coset, just for free. That used to be a hard job. You sit there, mom, 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 to get the cosets, right? You just look at it. And that's what we really need, because that's what we need to make. That's what an induced representation uh -huh. is, is it? one built on cosets. These are all linkable. Go see where this thing was first published. Um, 
in uh, that uh, International Journal of Molecular Science. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Ah, uh, yes. We are here to deal with a icosahedron, the B a C60. Here's the doorway. The doorway is going to come through this symmetry, actually this one. This is T-symmetry. Remember I told you it's weird. It's planes that are warped. It's, it's uh, f fan blades that are twisted so they would fan if you spun them around their axes. And uh, that's available. You could spin this fan right here around this axis. You could sp spin this fan right here, and it goes inside there obviously, around this axis, and finally uh, the one that's standing there is perpendicular uh, to this axis. Okay. So um, that is, uh, th this is the hardest group to really visualize. But if you square it up, this is called TH symmetry. We're going to diagram all of these. Um, except for this one, uh, soon. But let me point out that if you uh, make this uh, the way it is, Cartesian, uh, uh, in a Cartesian position, that is x, y, and z, everything lined up, these are uh, equal rectangles, and you make the rectangle's aspect ratio, the golden ratio, you have built an icosahedron. So this enormous symmetry that's just not loud in a crystal business, this is its doorway to being in a crystal. The icosahedrons can go and sit in TA symmetry and it's all hunky-dory. Well, maybe it's just hunky or maybe it's just dory, I don't know which, but the, these uh, molecules actually sit in their crystal and rotate, so this is really not necessarily an issue at first until you go to low temperatures. Okay, so I just wanted to show you, you know, that's where we, that's our goal right there is to understand that thing, right? But we're using these others now and they're not trivial either, so uh, we'll have plenty to uh, exercise our minds with. Yeah. Uh, when you try to uh, study molecules which are not solids, like which are they don't make solids necessarily, yeah. but SF6, if you freeze that, it's a very nice solid. Yeah, my question it's really was, hard to do. So should you study these molecules at extremely low temperatures to invoke symmetry? Or is there any temperature above which the symmetry goes away because of Those are all questions we'd like to know for that molecule. Um, we, as you probably know, the water molecule is a harmless little D2 <laughs> symmetry, right, which is actually not quite deep. I mean, if you really look at the molecule, it's the inertia tensor that has D2 symmetry, right? It's a C2V symmetry, okay? You may have seen the latest Physics Today uh, magazine. Uh, the cover story is about ice, snowflakes, and all the crazy f uh, things they form, okay? So you take the, these guys with just that lowly symmetry, and it makes hexagonal. How does it do that? <laughs> wow, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, there's so many things about even the simplest ones uh, that we uh, are only now beginning to get a little bit of understanding. And uh, all the ones that I know and love, of course, are gas phase. Because that's where we used to be able to do high resolution. The only place we could do high resolution, really high resolution. Okay? Times are changing. We hope <laughs> to the better. Okay, so uh, I'd like to show you the OH uh, symmetry. Okay, um, it's the one that's at the very peak of this uh, zoo. Okay, and its subgroups are TD, O, and TH, which we just talked about. TD is really important because there are a lot of tetrahedral molecules, and that's the symmetry. Methane. Methane is causing us problems now uh, because it's one of the global warming. It's a very absorbed infrared uh, uh, molecule, even though it's not a, a dipole uh, active transition. Um, only until when it gets a little excited. <laughs> Look out. Anyway, our T symmetry, our weird T symmetry right here, mostly 120, it's just got a subgroup 
of 180 degrees. That's the D2 subgroup right there. Okay, so the T symmetry uh, here, uh, this guy right here, uh, lots of C3 uh, subgroup, but there's a couple, three elements in there that are D2, uh, so make us D2 subgroup. That. That's it. This thing doesn't have much it can talk to on this chart here. But it is connected uh, to this guy right here, who in turn is connected to that, who in turn is connected to icosahedral, which is off the crystal chart. So, uh, today is we're going to look at the funny things a spectre can do with octahedral symmetry, particularly octahedral H, that means horizontal plane reflector is allowed, and that makes it have a reflective plane in all three axes. Uh, and D6H, we've already talked about uh, D6 and D6H, uh, that's, those are the two that we're going to um, be making a comparison at the very end of this lecture, but mo most of this is, we've got to get the octahedral stuff out of the way. Anyway, um, the O symmetry, octahedral symmetry, without any uh, things that are undoable, like uh, inversions and reflections, which is all you have in the lower half of this, these are all rotations up here, 180 degrees, 120 degrees, 90 and minus 90 and 180. And uh, this guy right here, which are 180 around edges. Okay? That makes the O symmetry, and that's what we're going to deal with mostly today. But it's really easy to deal with the whole thing by outer product with a C2-like, uh, well, group. It's the inversion group. And we'll talk about that later on. But in any case, once you do that, take all of the 24 elements that are up here and multiply each one of them by the inversion I. If you do that, you get reflections and uh, rotation reflections and uh, some pretty squirrely operations uh, that are harder to view than these. But in any case, they exist and they make up the other half of this monster symmetry, OH. So this is OH here. And here at subgroups. This group right here, really important, T diagonal, tetrahedral diagonal symmetry. The TD symmetry right here. So many molecules have that symmetry. And it is isomorphic to this group. That is, everything that you do with this group valid as character table or irreducible representations uh, for this group. They just have to be a little bit careful because of the eyes that are on this that are not on this, but um, that's easily uh, that's taken into account. Okay, so this is the this is the monster that we're going to deal with. We're going to be making representations and characters of it. Um, let's see if I skipped anything there. There's the entire cube. Uh, you see, uh, in addition to. RZ, this was empty before, it's now got a sigma X plane reflection. This is a sigma Y plane reflection. Okay, the X plane, uh, where does the X plane uh, lie? Uh, the X plane is uh, perpendicular to the uh, rotation X axis, that would be right there. You can see a little symbol on that line right there, that's the actual operation that this represents. And you can see that this sigma X here takes the unit and puts it in the sigma x place. And then there's a sigma y right here. It takes the unit and puts it right next door. Okay, but some of these operations take one way over to your side, like the inversion. The inversion takes the one and sticks it way out in the back, right Be behind. Just put this thing back together again and it's right down in the corner there. So this slider, even if you don't have the thing you hold in your hands, this you can hold in your brain, sort of. Right? That's the, uh, my claim anyway. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> All right? So that, that's the kind of thing that we have. And then here are the modern notations that go on the cube uh, for these. And the only difference is this IR, I didn't want to write it, all those symbols. It's just S tilde, X, Y, and Z. Okay? There's an SY right there. That's a weird operation. You do a, a 90 degree rotation, then you invert it. Some of these operations are not really at the tip of your, your tongue. <laughs> They're, uh, you have to think about them a little bit. Okay? But we do know that a, a reflection of, is an I times an 180 degrees. We do know, we do, I think, have get a feeling for that. 
And remember, I asked you to uh, think about that Camphis letter and uh, 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 extend our D2 analysis to twice as big, right? The D2H. So besides doing D4, uh, you should maybe do D2H first, uh, you know, just to get up to speed here. Okay, and then the little s's, they're the inversion times 120. That's a weird operation. And then I times 180 degrees on X and Y, there's sigma X, Y, and Z. That's what we were just talking about, sigma X and sigma Y, uh, right there. Sigma Z's plane is over here. You see a little sigma Z there. Okay. okay. Um, let's uh, proceed here. Now this is what really makes group theory all, uh, difficult, is the fact that if I've got fermions, I've got a spin a half object, this is my table. I've got minuses in half of the places because when you do 180 degree rotation, that's complement to one on the other side, right? If you do a 200, a 360 degree rotation, you're not home. You're at minus. So whenever this thing leaves you in a minus position, you get a minus sign here. We're not going to use that right away. But anyway, there are the, remember the Hamilton turn vectors that uh, work for this. And Here's a 90 degree rotation. It's a 45 degree arc. Remember, you just use half of the uh, actual rotation that you would see in three space in order to do a rotation in half space, half spin space. That's the actual slide rule there where you lay it all down on a plane and then just imagine moving it around. Um, we're not going to do much with that. Um, simply because experiments with spin a half are few and far between for the monsters that we're dealing with here. Okay, let's uh, bring all of this stuff up to speed here because we have some character stuff to do and we're going to do that very quickly. That's the beginning of it right there, the tetrahedral T-class algebra. Okay, now this is a case where the lecture was already too big uh, to spend time going through the details of the uh, O characters, particularly the ones that are most difficult. But just by clicking on this, and it doesn't show an underline, but you can click on this one to start it. That'll take you to the beginning. And then uh, more than 25, 27 pages later, we finish the character development. So character development is not as simple as D3. And we'll see why in uh, just a minute here. But um, you click on uh, the start and go through it step by step by step, and you'll, you'll see the algebra. The T uh, is not that bad. Uh, I've got to show a couple of steps here. First of all, where do you get the multiplication table? I look in here and I see four units. Forget the minus signs, remember. Just ignore the minus signs for our classical groups uh, theory. Uh, four uh, times the unit operator. Okay, And then I've got up here uh, the um, 180 degree X, Y's, and Z's. That's uh, three guys in a, in a class. And that class appears there. Well, let's just count how many R1 squares there are. One, two, three, four. It's got to be four of all the others. Okay? So that's the answer for the uh, all commuting, character generating class algebra. I didn't even bother to draw this one. This number would, would, uh, would uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this one would appear there as well as there, and then this one would appear over here as well as there, and so forth. I'm sorry, this one would appear there, this one would appear down there. Okay. So, it's abelian. Uh, they don't use the name abelian when they describe an algebra that commutes, but uh, maybe they should. Okay, so that, generating that's pretty easy. Okay, now minimal equations, it takes quite a bit of a step here, but just going ahead and using that table, I come up with a minimal equation with four factors. I'm I'm almost home. I, I just have to uh, I'll put this together to make projectors. Okay. Well, we're not. It's not that simple. You've got to do a little algebra. Uh, that, and you could get a minimal equation for this uh, row guy, but gee, that's only d2. That's just something uh, that would uh, tell you about the d2 part of this. It's the threefoldness of this group that really dominates. And you see that when you go ahead. And this is the finish right here. Uh, here are all of the projectors worked out 
uh, from those minimal equations that we get, or that one minimal equation that we got, and uh, that's the result right there. So you read off from this the characters. Okay? Now remember what you have to do is you have to multiply the coefficient of the, um, uh, the unit operator by the order of this group, which is 12. So you get 12 times 3 is 36 over 4 is 9. And then you take the square root of it and you get the dimension. Anybody remember that? <laughs> no, here's where you do it. Okay? And then all the rest of these have 1 12th. So I multiply by 12, I get 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So I've got three one-dimensional representations of here. Two of them in a complex pair. Did I tell you that this thing is dominated by 120 degree rotations? That's most of this character table. It's three-foldness. And that's what it is. It looks like a three-fold star that can be pointed in uh, three different directions. That's T-symmetry. Really weird. This thing. Really weird. Okay? Now, TH, not so bad, but still, it's got uh, this thing to cross C2, basically. Uh, and uh, we'll leave that off for right now. Okay, here's the bad one. Octahedral. First of all, we've got to take the class sums, and we've got to figure out how they multiply. That's a great big table you're looking at. We can just count and do it, but you can also do it in a little, little bit of intelligence. Imagine that you, the table is just too big to write. Uh, you would be pulling maneuvers like I'm showing here. But the step-by-step -step development, skipping a lot of steps here and explanations and things. We're using the fact that classes divide the order of the group, the order of class divides the order of the group, and all that sort of stuff. But this is the algebra that we're dealing with, and it's commutative. Okay. The minimal equation is C rho, again, not interesting. We need somebody else to give us a help here. And it turns out it's CI. This guy right here is a minimal equation that has uh, all five, and there's five classes here, so we need five factors in order to get a character table. And uh, scrumble, 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 rumble, rumble, uh, we produce our first uh, uh, projection operator by crossing out the one with eigenvalue 2. We just name it P2, but that's not the, the name that uh, everybody else gives uh, to that particular irreducible projector. And uh, there's uh, the uh, alternative to that, okay? But at this point, you see, I can multiply through here by the, uh, the order of this group, 24. I go 24 times this factor right here. So what do I get? Well, I get 24 divided by 8 is 3 times 3. I get 9. Again, the square root of 9 is uh, the dimension. And then at this point, uh, it, the uh, derivation says, hey, you got to do some work too, reader. Uh, remaining characters, that's this one, this one, and this one, are left as homework. Okay? <laughs> but you know, we already have gotten this, right? A lot less than 27 or, well, actually this is 40 pages. If you go really step by step, we got that in one sort of screwing around with D matrices from the uh, O3 group, right? which I will remind you of uh, shortly here. Okay, so now we can get busy with stuff that will connect to physics uh, fair, fairly uh, easily. The um, characters of this big OH, that's important because in all of the literature you're going to see G's and U's. And the, what we're doing here is we're taking this character table here and multiplying it Cartesian-wise with this one. This is the inversion C2 group. It's usually called CI, C sub, usually lowercase i, but I want to emphasize uh, the uh, big fat i that is the inversion operator that commutes with every possible rotation. This guy right here is just a multiple of the unit matrix. It's a minus times a unit matrix. Okay. And it's the one that determines the parity that most people talk about in all physics fields, nuclear physics, particle physics, uh, ellipsometry, you name it. Uh, this is the character table we're dealing with. It's this character table repeated once, twice, and then three times, 
and then again with minus sign. So we're just using one, one, one three times, and then minus one of that character table. So this was not hard to get. We didn't mention it when we got this thing, but uh, there's the rest of it. Okay. Now what is it's some German comes in here? Uh, Vile apparently beat Hans Beta at getting uh, some physics involved with this symmetry. So somehow it got Gerhard. I think that Gerhard. Anybody know German? I pronounce it correctly. But G for Gerhard, which is even. And then odd is Ungerhard, not even. <laughs> okay, you, 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 you. Okay, so we get all the representations that we know from this character table, A1, A2, E, T1, and T2. We get them again with U's on them. But we put G's on them on the first go around. Okay? So, these are going to have different names. The, these guys here, the T1s, those are the vectors. But this is a polar vector right here. One that you get with an actual charged dipole. This is a magnetic pseudo vector uh, that you get uh, from a, a, a rotation vector like omega or a B uh, a field, a magnetic field vector, okay? They're pseudo vectors. This is a real vector, it's a pseudo vector, okay? Then there are the tensors, okay? This is a tensor and that's a pseudo tensor. You know, this is the one that we were talking about with the XYs and the YZs and all of that. This is something else again entirely comes up with third angular momentum. Th uh, cubic uh, thing uh, right there. We never got to talk about that because we, we just went that far. Okay, so this is our baby. <laughs> like it or not, that's what cubes do and octahedrons and uh, other things like cubo octahedrons. Yeah. And the, the pseudo scalar. And well. yes, we've got several of them. Even before we put the inversion on, we had an A1 and an A2, very often this is yeah. given the name yeah. pseudo-scalar, because all it has is a minus with respect to these odd operations. Uh, so, it's not too terrible, right? But this one down here, oh my god, how odd can you be? Yeah, I see. Be really odd, right? <laughs> okay, and we'll see how, where they come up in angular momentum. We didn't have to go that far, uh, just for these. Okay, any questions? Um, is it? Fairly clear what you know. What are we do? What the animal is? What kind of hair it has? And <laughs> uh, stripes. A little bit of what? How many stripes? Yeah, it's like the bar and the character tables. Like they really tell a lot about the group. The, uh, the corner, the left inferior corner tells you the. the uh, when you're on the left here, yeah. and you're. Uh, you said interior, inferior, yeah. left, uh, inferior, lower. Uh, you're seeing the largest dimensions. Now, that's the way I always draw character. I think that's pretty common to put the uh, thing in this order. Rather than putting the most difficult things at the top, we put the easiest ones uh, at the top and work our way down uh, to bigger and bigger things. We'll talk about four-dimensional uh, symmetries a little bit later on. You get some huge dimensions uh, with uh, just four, but as you go to five, six, eight, it starts to get astronomical. And of course, permutation groups, I mean, it's going on factorial, right? Forever. So that gets hot real fast. <laughs> this one is half of S5. That's, you know, S5 is already too big for the buckyball. It, it's called the alternating group of five, which is, this is sort of the alternating group of the octahedral system. Okay, let's uh, hit it off here with some characters. What I want to do is I want to use these characters to figure out uh, how uh, those irreducible representations, particularly the triplets, are going to split when they're reduced to a lower symmetry. So that's the name of the game from here on out. Now, I want to show first a correlation table between the big OH, which is twice as big as the little O guy. Okay. Now, the way I draw O, by the way, is something to put some chirality into it. So I, I bend the corners off of the uh, planes there, so they're little propellers. 
that uh, have a handedness to them. So uh, that's you know that's a picture I use uh, for all of the things like the T uh, uh, group. And notice these this guy here doesn't have that, and this one doesn't have that, right? Um, here's T D, which kind of does have it, but in a, in a funny kind of way. Um, so that be it be it as it, as it, it may. You would like to have a correlation table for every subgroup of any group you deal with, and this particular correlation table is really easy. And all it's asking you is, if for some reason I lose all of this, what happens to the uh, representations that we uh, had before we dis uh, destroyed that part of the symmetry? What, where does A1G end up? Well, it ends up in A1, but so does A1U. They both end up in A1. And then A2G and A2, they both end up in A2. It's a diagonal correlation table, really simple. So it's a big group going to half speed here. Uh, it's producing a diagonal correlation table. Okay, That's easily and pretty obvious. Uh, just from, you know, how easy was it to get this thing? Well, it's easy to correlate it. The others are not quite so easy. I want to do, um, this is pretty much all we need today is the octahedral group reduced to fourfold symmetry. And we'd also like to do it to, to threefold. We're going to spend our time on the fours just to get oriented and then we'll bring them, them in uh, at the very end here. So. Uh, at the, at, after I get done with this, I want to compare fourfold versus threefold, and even twofold, which um, for today's stuff we don't need, but it will be very much important uh, in the next lecture. So that's where we're headed. So how do you figure out uh, how O is going to be looking like? Uh, that is a system that has O symmetry. What's it going to happen to its levels if you go and put, say, in a uh, a magnetic field on the z-axis and leave the thing with a d4 symmetry. Or you just put some, uh, some extra heavy or different atom on the z-axis, uh, say on both sides, because d4 is a two-sided group, uh, that uh, will cause the levels to do something, split mostly. So it's a, it's a generalized um, Stark or Zeeman splitting problem that we're, we're, we're looking at here. So we're asking if I take O and reduce it to that symmetry right there by twisting its little uh, propeller so that uh, it now has a special axis, uh, uh, say in that case it would be the Y axis the way we orient things, but we'd probably be calling it the Z axis uh, over here. So when I do that, when I, when I destroy uh, the um, thing by putting something on the corner of a, say, an octahedron. Suppose I, uh, and this is what we really will be doing here, is we'll be imagining that something's happening so that this, this molecule is, is somehow uh, held in some kind of vice or whatever, or by nature as it turns out, to be just on or near uh, one of its major x, y, or z axes. And let's make it the z axis because there are all equivalent. So what I'm going to lose right away as a symmetry are all the 120s. They're out. Cross them out. Uh, they're, they're gone. But I'm still going to have a couple uh, 180 degree rotation around Z is still a symmetry for uh, D4 and so are the 90 degree rotations around Z. So we throw away most of this class. Just keep the Z. We throw away two-thirds of this class just keep the Z, okay? And that's why I'm indicating by arrows uh, the elements of the D4 uh, symmetry. Now it has an XY 180 degree rotations as well as a diagonal 180 degree rotation. So when you do, don't forget that one. It still has two of these elements in it. I3 and I4, if we're looking at the thing uh, right down the Z axis, there are still symmetries just like X and Y, there's a, uh, uh, around 100 degree, two different 180 degree uh, axes. Uh, so um, that and that and that, I guess, is 
what we're uh, really after here. So we're going to ask, if I do this, this arrow, it's like a knife that's I've stabbed into O and made it smaller, D4. So the D4 operations here are uh, what we're uh, looking at. And we're looking at it for uh, each one of these uh, representations. Starting with the easy one, A1. Okay? If I start with the e easy guy, uh, oh, and eventually we're going to uh, take this down to C4, but let's just do one thing at a time here. Let's do the D4. Okay? So that's what we're uh, talking about. And I'm going to bring this guy up to uh, speed so that uh, we can point at uh, various things that uh, we're doing here. We're right in the middle of this uh, procedure right here. Okay? So, uh, I, I, I look at A1 of the octahedron, okay, and I compare it to A1 of the D4. Well, surprise, surprise, they're the same. So we're absolutely certain that uh, A1 is going to become A1 in the new thing. Now, I've written this one as up and down straight, and this one as italic. That's not part of the literature. Literature doesn't do that. Just say A1. And let, expect you to know this is an A1 of a subgroup that's coming out of here. This group is the one in effect after the breaking of the symmetry uh, down. Now, what about the A2? Okay. If I go and look at uh, you know, what the A2 of the octahedron uh, would be, I, I see this guy right here, uh, and that belongs over here is a minus, okay? So the way I've got it lined up here, uh, you can see uh, that uh, I would be interested in uh, this guy, uh, B1. So when I, uh, I crush the symmetry, any A2 level is going to turn into a B1. So that, that's the notation for subduction of this representation. That's the answer right there. B1 of D4. Is this fairly clear? Okay, this is uh, uh, what we uh, do. Now E, it's a two-dimensional representation, so this is a little more difficult now. We're asking, you know, what, well maybe it, this, this two-dimensional representation would be this guy, but I wonder, can I make that? Is that uh, uh, what we're uh, going to uh, be seeing here? Is that okay? Uh, the zero looks pretty good, okay, and the row xy, um, well, that's not zero. That's not zero at all, okay. Uh, this is, but, hmm, maybe I have to think this through. This isn't right either. So it isn't, it isn't uh, a case that the E uh, of the octahedron is going to be, uh, doesn't look like it's going to be the E of the D4, and indeed it's not. The sum of these two right here gives me uh, what I need, okay? I need a zero here, I get it. I need a zero, I'm sorry, I need a two there, I need a zero there, and I need a two here, and I need, of course, one there. So this is a case where E did not become E, E became A1 plus B1. Now this is a splitting that we're gonna play with a little bit. This is like the splitting that's actually going on up there. The, the, there's a, a fight going on between an A1 and an A2 on the uh, uh, screen over there. We'll talk about that later, but this is similar to it. This is where a two-dimensional thing got split by symmetry breaking. Now, the triples, the triples are, you know, th this is where uh, you really have to try a few uh, different things in order to get a, a correct answer. But this one definitely involves an E, but it also, in order to get these numbers uh, right here, I've got to add something else with a minus, okay? So the T comes in and then I need two minuses, so it looks like I'm going to have an A2 here. So this guy right here, and let's just check that it works here, uh, I get a 1 plus 0, that's 1, and then I get a 1 plus a minus 2, that's a minus 1. So this checks out. It gives me the T T1 breaking up into a doublet plus a singlet, A2 a singlet, one of the pseudo scalars. And then, uh, same deal with the T2. It also breaks up into an E, but this time it uses B2 right here. 
uh, as its uh, um, companion in splitting. This is it. Okay, so that's character analysis without using the frequency formula. It's like doing crossword puzzles, sort of, or could Sudoku or some. You know, I mean, you're doing some arithmetic uh, trial and error. There is a unique solution. So this is our correlation table right here. And that correlation table is a level splitting table. It's telling us that E breaks up not into E, but to two of these guys, uh, a scalar and a uh, back and forth pseudo scalar, B1. And then the T's split into a doublet plus something else, and it's the other ones, A2 and B2, that get to play the game uh, with that. So, level splitting, this is a diagram that the physicist would draw instead of doing that. Okay? It's basically saying A1 goes to A1. A2 goes to B1. E splits into A1 plus B1. What's plus this? Because that, that's not meant to be, but it's kind of convenient for mnemonic purposes. T1 splits into an E, a doublet, and then this uh, other pseudoscalar, A2. And finally, this guy right down here, T2. Now, this is a color scheme uh, that we uh, use because when we do a computer calculation and these eigenvalues all come out on top of each other, very often the colors mix to indicate what it is you have. So it's, a, it's kind of a neat technique uh, for doing uh, computation. Now we've got one more step here. This is D4. I want to go to C4. C4 consists just, consist just of these 90 degree rotations here and, and 180. C4 has four elements, uh, three not counting the identity. So that's the next step here. I want to take uh, this uh, thing uh, to um, the C4 level. But the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it by taking the D4 and seeing how it splits. Once I do that, then I can just peel off uh, from that diagram we already have to get a correlation between the very top, the O, and the very bottom that we're now exploring, uh, C4. Now, C4 just consists of these uh, two real representations, one of them putting minuses on uh, uh, two of the 90 degree rotations, and then the 180 degree rotation gets to be one. But then uh, there's the usual uh, zero phase, one phase, and then two phase, and three phase modulo four uh, listing of uh, the complex um, numbers that are on the x and y uh, real and imaginary axes. So, what we do here is we say, okay, A1 of D4, I just ask, uh, how, does that, uh, how does that break with, with C4? Well, uh, pretty much uh, you're seeing that A1 of D4 is this. Everything else is crossed out here except for these uh, rotations by 90 plus or minus and 180. Uh, just like before, that's a 0 mod 4. That's the scalar of the C4. And then, what about B1, this guy right here, okay? Uh, it's got minuses in every other place. Where do I have a situation like that? Well, it's 2 mod 4, that right there. So, uh, and then A2, this guy uh, down here, this third, third one. Well, it kind of looks to me like an a, a, a scalar of this, and it is. And then finally we have here uh, B2, okay, this guy right here. Well, that's just like this one. So I get another 2-4. Two, get two of those coming out uh, of, of this list. Uh, one more to go. E. Okay. Right here. E uh, drops to C4. Uh, well, you can see what it's... it's uh, we've got to produce this out of these. And we haven't used these, so they're the ones to try. That gives me uh, 2. That gives me 0. That gives me minus 2. And that gives me zero. So the imaginary cancel out makes me a standing wave. It kind of affected that because of the D4 going to uh, C4 uh, would give me a one 
uh, and then minus 1 mod 3. That's what 3 mod 4 uh, really should be called. Now, I'll rewrite it that way uh, in this thing. So here's the correlation table for D4 to C4, and then here's the correlation of O to D4. What we need now is to make the correlation table of this O all the way down to here, okay? Well, you could kind of screw around with the tables, but this is where the level splitting really helps. Level splitting is uh, really nice. We've already gotten it down to D4. Now we just have to look at what the D4 does, okay? Uh, here's a D4A1. It's going to go to 0 mod 4, okay? So, well, let me just show the whole thing. B1 is going to go to 2 mod 4, okay? That's this one. And then that's going to happen uh, everywhere. Everywhere there's a B1, I'm going to see a 2 mod 4. Everywhere there's a B2, I'm going to see another 2 mod 4. And then the E's are going to go 1 and minus 1. So this is the correlation table that we would really like to have uh, for our work to come in a few minutes here. Okay, so uh, let's uh, do that. Here's the, um, su the subduction from O all the way down to C4. And so we got A1 going to 0 mod 4. We got A2 going to 2 mod 4. That's this right here. And then we got E right here going to plus or minus 1 mod 4. That's, uh, let's see, is, did I do that right? Uh, e, uh, 1, 4. This is a typo. Okay, that should be moved over should be these uh, two guys right here, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check that uh, to see if that is, is right. 0 mod 4, 2 mod 4, um, 0 mod 4, 2 mod 4. That's kind of weird. Let's see if I, I got that. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't shift it. It should be 1 and minus 1. And uh, that's what should be coming out of there. Let's see. What did I do wrong? You see? <laughs> oh, let me trace her out again. Let's see. The A1 goes through A1 A1. So that's okay. A2 and now is okay. I'm tracing the B1 through. That ends up on 2 sub 4. And, uh, let's see. This, this is definitely right here. A, A2 and E. B2 and E. That's weird. I went through this a little faster than I should have. Um, the T1 splitting into O mod 4, that makes sense. And then a plus and minus 1 is what it should have done. And the um, bottom two tables don't align. Let's look at this T1 up here. T1 goes to A2 plus E. Okay. T2. T1 goes to A2 plus E. And E definitely goes to that. So, um, what I'd like to say is T1 goes to 0 mod 4, and then 1 mod 4, and minus 1 mod 4. So that's okay, actually. That's what this is saying. I don't know, I just read it wrong. And then this one right here is T2 going to 2 mod 4, and the, the double. Is that right? So the, the table's right. This is, is right. And now let me read it backwards. Yeah, I, I recognize it now. It's just right. Okay. There does just seem to be a disjunction between the bottom two tables. If you run this E through to the, the way it splits over here, yeah. it doesn't align proper. The E splits into 1 and minus 1, okay. The B2 splits into 2 mod 4. B2 here splits into 2 mod 4. That's okay. And where does the E turn out? The E pops e, e, out here. E down here. The last two tables. Plus and minus 1 my four, right? And so each of these E's and turns into that. It shows zero mod four and two mod four in this middle table on the bottom, so they, we do need to look this over later. Um, I, I see what you're Cor saying. Yeah, correlate the two E's. Those are yeah. it, not in, those are in poor alignment. So we'll, we'll yeah, yes, 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 them. yes. That's right. Um, the E should, should go to to one and uh, this, of course, is the octahedral E, right? Not to be confused with 
the D4E. That's the problem. This is what a D4E does with respect to a C4, right? It's not what the E that goes with the octahedron does. That's the problem. <laughs> okay? And that's the whole problem with the starting with beta, the labeling of these things, is that I use the same symbol uh, uh, for the D4 uh, stuff uh, that has an E, okay? The E of, of the octahedron is right here, but the E of the D4 is very different from the E of the octahedron. So that's what we're screwing. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. That's All right, with that time. out of the way, let's go and do something with these. First of all, compare uh, this, uh, and I'm going through this fairly quickly. The C3 uh, subgroup correlation involves just three representations, 0, 1, and minus 1 modulo 3. And you see the T breaking up like a Zeeman splitting that you would expect. You might not understand that one. Uh, as easily, unless you're with tensors, and then this is the other part of a tensor uh, that makes sense uh, uh, in the sort of uh, back room dealings that we uh, did to uh, produce our representations. But here, let's just, uh, we've already done this one, octahedral to C4, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we've done octahedral to C4, um, and uh, actually, um, I should have reversed this. This is, this one right here is the most common uh, local symmetry, and this is the second most common symmetry, and this one is really weird. Uh, we will we'll only see this in the next lecture, um, or in a preview of that, uh, which I'll show uh, at the very end today. But um, this is what we just got uh, right here, the T1 into 0, 1, and minus 1 and the T2 into 2, and 1 and minus 1, and then these guys, the E, uh, into 0 and 2, and that's an octahedral E. Okay, this is kind of weird. This is the threefold axis, and threefold axes do different things, uh, very much so. Now, um, this picture appears in two places, and there's a lot of reading matter that's very different from these two textbooks. Um, might be worth looking at both of them and putting them together. Uh, they take different approaches. But here's where we're going to use that character formula. Uh, and we're going to use it uh, just to show that this is a really hard way to do things. But this is what we're after. We're after a correlation now with the entire Lie algebra and group associated with rotations in three dimensions, all rotations and all rotation inversions in three dimensions. And uh, um, admittedly, this is smaller than that, but this is way bigger than that. This is only 48 elements, and this is only 24, and this is an infinite, infinite, infinite uh, uh, order. Okay? So we're, we're taking a really big jump now uh, of breaking our angular momentum, guys, and we're going to fill this up with a, quite a few angular momenta. But we've already done this. This is our, our sneaky way to get the uh, uh, representations. Uh, T1, uh, and we didn't have a U on it, but that, that's okay. Here are the T1 U Z, just two balls pointing in the Z direction, T1 U in the X direction, and T1 U in the Y direction. The three components that this has uh, correlate very nicely uh, with uh, the um, the uh, first entry here, which is angular momentum 1, the vector. So we, the vector orbital does not split. You put this in a cubic field, and they stay degenerate. That's, at first you'd say, ah, that doesn't make sense. How can it do that? But it does. And uh, now the 2 does split. The 2 splits into an EG and a T2G. And uh, that's what we're getting from the characters uh, with this. But we already know that from what we did with these orbitals, okay? Here were the three T2Gs, and here were the two EGs uh, right down there. And the textbook gives a, a picture of one of the EGs, the X squared minus Y squared one, is the one laying on the side here down at the bottom. 
That's an EG number one, but it's x squared minus y squared number one. Okay, and that's a sort of a crummy diagram of what the wave function looks like. That's in uh, uh, chapter five of the uh, principles of symmetry uh, book. Okay, now this thing puts the wave function right on the axis where there may be uh, something to repel it, and that's the situation that we're envisioning here. This is the, for solid state physics, the single most important splitting in the entire field. These are all the, uh, the mid of the periodic, middle of the periodic chart elements that have a d uh, orbital waiting for a crystal field uh, to work on it or to bind in a crystal field. And the splitting between EG and QG is responsible for almost all of the band gaps that we uh, you know, are responsible for our cell phones ringing <laughs> and doing all the stuff they do in our computers. Just about everything in this room is due to that splitting. <laughs> you really have to revere this splitting. <laughs> it is really important. Okay. And these guys here, uh, they, um, they, uh, th this particular one, uh, is, the gr is the lower state if there's uh, things to repel. Now, if there's something to attract, then they flip. Okay, if the x, y, and z axis have attractive to electrons, right? Usually not. If the thing's a nucleus, it's positive, right? If they have something attractive, okay, then this guy wins and that one's up top. Okay, so that splitting, however it happens, uh, is really important. Okay, but what about all of the others you see? Okay. We just talked here about um, principle, that's P waves, and then D for diffuse, these are, these are names given by spectroscopists of bombers and uh, various series of hydrogen transitions to almost Rydberg state. Uh, this one particularly is getting close to Rydberg, okay? But you can see, whereas this one right here is obviously a T1 and a T1U, uh, we might add, uh, all of the odd angular momentums get uh, U's. There's a U, there's a U, there's a uh, U coming on, uh, there, if I were to finish that one. Uh, so that, that's just, um, the, you know, the properties of single electron orbitals. Uh, and these are the names they give. And as I, as I pointed out before, we kind of run out of things to give names when we go up to the angular momentum four. That's something that happens in the actinide rare earth elements at the very bottom of the periodic chart. Uh, and then phi, my gosh, I, I call that one. H stands for hell knows, I stands for I don't know, and K stands for can't tell. <laughs> it's the best I can do. But this isn't much worse than this, right? <laughs> as far as labeling. But we use that labeling uh, for our angular momentum to this day. In fact, in molecular physics, which does go up here, they put the Greek letters for each of these. And we'll see that later on uh, in uh, various papers. So when I do number two, well, you can see that I have to add this plus this in each of the slots of the character table in order to get the numbers up here. And so that tells me right away that I've got an EG and a 2G. We already knew that, right, just by the, looking at the uh, top-down way of getting uh, character tables. Okay? So you, you, you've seen uh, it's like Joni Mitchell's song, I've seen clouds from this way and that way. I've seen them from both sides now, right? And uh, that's the way you learn. Um, you probably more than both is needed. Okay, so now the cluster structure. This is really cool. Um, this is our invention. The idea that you can make a band series, it's kind of like a DNA series, it respects the order of those species even when they cluster them differently. And that's what I'd like to give you a little bit of a feeling for uh, before we um, wind up here uh, today. I'd like to, to compare this uh, to what we had with D6. Uh, and, and, um, and let me just do it right now uh, with regard to J equal 30, which is off the charts uh, for the, that we were just doing. 
uh, the chart that we uh, went to on this thing went to 20. Well, go another 10, and now that's what we're going to talk about. And it can be read off from this wheel, even J, so it's this one you use. And it's not too different from the odd, but there is an odd even uh, difference that is important. Okay? So if you read, um, I guess I could call this, um, they have things in India like prayer wheels, uh, or is that Tibetan? Oh, the wheels? You have a, the something you spin and then you, you look at kind of like a roulette wheel and you do a certain prayer if it comes up. Oh, yeah, it's colored sand. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that one. Yeah. Well, this is my prayer wheel. Uh, in this particular case, with J equal 30, I start here on the threefold side and wind around and then come out and end right here. So I have uh, at the end of the spectrum E, T2, A2. Okay? E, T2, A2. Okay? Next one. T2, T1. T2, T1. Right? All the way around. Now, when do I start, when do I stop going on the outside? I go, I stop going on the outside when my angular momentum cone spread is bigger than this angle, 35.3. So right here on the seventh try, I'm out of business. So I only get one, two, three, four, five, six, and this one is, is broken up. Nevertheless, the ordering of this of wheel continues, but now reading on the inside until finally it comes and stops uh, right there with A1. Isn't this amazing? <laughs> I mean, it took us a while before we saw this, but every spectrum we looked at, it, did, it didn't care how you were clustering or what order, what, what, what actual spacings you had there. Uh, it cared just about the ordering. So th this is, um, you know, something very fundamental to the, the node structure of the waves on this thing. And these, now we're talking about a wave function of the, if you want to say it, angular momentum vector. But it's probably better to say you're, you're, you're taking the, the third Euler axis and asking where is it, you see, of the rotating body relative to the laboratory. In other words, you're, what you're watching is a laboratory zenith processing. Just, you know, makes your head hurt <laughs> to think that that's what we're doing uh, to get this uh, the quantum mechanics of those um, uh, clusters of, of levels. Okay, so in the actual spectrum here with 88, I do the same thing, and this ordering is maintained uh, from one side to the other. Over on this side, every one of these things is this uh, column, the zero mod four. In other words, if the angular momentum is 88, 84, 80, 76, all divisible by 4, or 72, that's the last one that shows up on this particular thing with J equal 88. And then they just continue the same series uh, all the way through to the end, but they now use this correlation table with C3. So that is, I mean, remarkable that it can do that. But let's try to make it less remarkable by making a connection with D6. Here's the D6 up wheel. And again, these are all uh, things that are in the uh, PSDS uh, book. But now what you're going to be seeing is A1, E1, E2, B1 for band boundary, and then B2, and there'll be a little bit of a gap if you have a weak potential. There'll be a great big gap if you uh, are doing uh, a uh, thing that has uh, really respecting the local symmetry of each of the potential wells. Here, you'll just see it go along and make doublets, A2, A1, with generally very small splittings. 
uh, E1, double it, E2, double it. There's no E3, E3 is B1 and B2. There'll be a little bit of a band boundary splitting there. And then it'll come counting backwards, E2, E1. Okay, uh, if we could swing the camera around to the, um, the uh, movie that we have going uh, here, I want to see some D6 behavior that's really uh, quite remarkable. Okay, and um, in particular, I want to see what happens when we take a doublet, and this is well above the barrier here, so the A1 and the A2 are practically degenerate. But let's look at the ones at the bottom here. These are the uh, clusters that are associated with uh, local symmetry um, 0 mod 2. And there's an A1 there, there's an E1 doublet right there, and they all go to this energy right here. You can hardly see the splitting. It's very tiny uh, between those. And we'll turn those waves on in a minute. I just want to show this one uh, in action uh, first before we get into the elementary ones. And then there's E2. Then uh, there's B1 and B2 is what it should be. There's uh, actually a uh, slight different uh, um, uh, numbering that's going on here. But then E2, starting back, counting backwards now, E2, E1, and then A2 and A1. Then it does it again. And up here is a B1 and the B2 starting the cycle over again. So you get an entire band of things that are respecting local symmetry 0 mod 2, and then you get an entire band that's respecting 1 mod 2 uh, 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 here. And you can see the splittings in them. It's the uh, kind of splittings that we, we would calculate using those 6 by 6 matrices. Then it starts to break up. You see here it's breaking up uh, quite a bit. And then the next a, a uh, B uh, that, that comes to uh, be near this one is what I'd like you to see. And let's just go with that thing. Right now the wave is going this way, more or less. It's galloping, right? And it, it, it's getting uh, a little bit smoother in its, its motion, but it's still kind of a funny galloping motion to the left, okay? But as time goes on, these phasers uh, attain a different relation to each other. They're slightly different frequencies. So right now, what it's doing, it's getting very jerky, very gallopy. Woomph, 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 okay? And these... Uh, Boundaries are closing in on the thing like teeth. The uh, teeth are eating this wave, and the wave is responding by uh, trying to keep going to the left, but it just can't uh, keep going forever. It finally said, All right, I'm going to stand still. You're, you've eaten me. Bump. The teeth are completely closed. And then it's starting to go this way. See that? This is just the dynamics of the uh, interference between two states, B1 and B2, which you will see if you mix the other, but it's so much faster when you do that. These are real close together, so it takes a long time, and this is what Bragg reflect reflection looks like. That's what the waves actually do. It's, this is the detailed dynamics. It isn't a photon that goes in, boing! It's this. This is what is actually going on at the uh, fundamental level. So now it's going smoothly to the right. Okay, let's go uh, and kill this poor thing. It's been eaten uh, at least ten times uh, during this period. It deserves uh, to be uh, put to uh, uh, sleep. So the first way we look at is really uh, a nice symmetric in global and symmetric uh, locally. Nice Gaussian thing. Now it's just a question, uh, as I go through these eigenstates, oops, sorry, I didn't want to do that. Get rid of that. Uh, so many automatic things here to miss here. Let me zero that one out. And let's get one of the E's going. This would be an E going to the left. So this is a moving wave moving to the left. You can sort of see it going through there, but I can make it into a standing wave by mixing its partner. Remember, these are degenerate. 
So I can do this and I won't get any Bragg reflection or refraction. But by adjusting their phases, which will remain relatively constant, I can make any shape I, kind of any shape I want. If I put the thing uh, sort of down here in phase representation, I just move the lumps over uh, to a different place. But they don't, if they're the same uh, amplitude, do any funny business, uh, galloping or moving at all. And the outer envelope, no matter where I set it, uh, will be constant. Oh darn, there's that thing, I can't push on that. Okay, and uh, I'll go ahead and put this one perpendicular to it, just for the sake of a difference, to show. Uh, a typical wave function that we make out of the E1. Now the E2, it's the same deal. We're still using things that are uh, globally symmetric. Here's uh, one, and I'm going to have it move to the right. So it happens so fast you can hardly see it. It just goes zip across there. Very fast phase velocity. Uh, kill the phase velocity by simply putting the uh, sines and cosines in combination with some phase lag, I make standing waves. Okay. So these are degenerate, and so is that one. But this one up here has a slight splitting. Well, it's more than a slight. It's a huge distance here between these clusters uh, that we're making uh, with this. Now, um, I'm going to kill that one and start this one. This one, you should recognize, it's still a bunch of Gaussians, but now they alternate back and forth. Okay? We're talking about a, a B2 uh, uh, right, right now. And the ones and twos depends on whether it's doing its nodes in the center of the potential or uh, in the center of the well. And what's going to happen right now, since we've got the um, centers of the nodes in a high potential region, uh, this is a low energy state. Very high energy to put your nose uh, where the potentials are. That is to put your anti-node uh, there. So by, uh, I, I've cranked, now I'm uh, way up here at this energy instead of down here. So this one is uh, really moving. Now, if I mix the two of these, I'll get Bragg reflection, but it's going to be really fast because uh, the distance between here is a high beat frequency. So if I take this one and this one and turn them on, it's dosey -si dose. <laughs> right back and forth really fast. That's Bragg reflection that happens in a half period. Okay. So this gives you a, a little bit of a feeling of what it is that exists just in the D6 problem, which involves waves around a ring. That's what we're looking at over there in the animations. And you see the ordering here uh, as I read uh, this thing, <coughs> and I um, uh, have to make sure I'm looking at the right thing here. E A1, E1 doublet, E2 doublet, B1. Then perhaps a gap but maybe a big one, maybe a small one. Then B2, E2, E1, and finally A2, and then we start over again. A1, E1, E2, B1, you see? Prayer wheel, very simple. And that's fairly simple. It's very one-dimensional. Not so this one, but it's doing the same thing. It's really uh, playing the same game. So here are the two cases. The case when I have a low barrier there, I just have a little bit small first Brillouin band gap, and it would really should be drawn, you know, very small. It should be almost a doublet like these two. So that should, you know, be really, really small. But here we're imagining it's monstrous between B1 and B2, and then very little splitting between B2 and A2 and even lot less splitting between these two. You can't even see the splitting on that screen for the first cluster of uh, D6 levels. So you get a large first Brillouin band gap, and maybe also a large second one if, you, if your potential goes high. 
depends. How many can you fit uh, in the lower part? And this, I'm using this thing to describe what's going on inside the laser pointer. They built things like that in order to make the laser pointer work. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of uh, like the Euroboros, the snake that eats its tail. <laughs> We're using our technology here to help you explain, uh, you know, uh, something that most people really don't know much about. And uh, here's the picture, actual picture of that thing with the, you know, the labeling. So we have, uh, with the D6 correlation, we've got the 0 mod 6, 1 mod 6, 2 mod 6, 3 mod 6, 4 mod 6, and 5 mod 6, 3 mod 6 being a, a single level. Uh, B1, B2, they come together on 3, 6, but each of the others are doubly degenerate, you see, an E1 and an E2. We start with A1, A2, okay, then we go to uh, E1, and then we go to E2, then we go to B1, B2, uh, in uh, the ordering that that wheel gives, and it's the same thing that's going to happen when you're deep down in here, and you're looking at the local symmetry, 0 mod 2 and 1 mod 2 correlated with D6. So you get a, 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 a here, a 0 mod 2 thing consists of an A1, an E2, uh, a B1, and an A1. Not necessarily in that order. We know what the ordering is now because uh, we've seen it. And then this one right here is the same thing except it's A2 with uh, E1 and E2 and B2. Okay, that, that's the uh, sort of clustering that's going on inside this below the barriers uh, far enough. But the ordering, it maintains the same regardless. That is really quite um, remarkable. It's basically counting nodes. So this, this is, you know, what we're dealing with. This is a bigger picture. This is will be finished here very shortly. But this, I just wanted you to see this one with the correct coloring uh, that we use to make the, the bands actually try to show. And we hope to do a better job of this. This is the best we can do um, so far. Um, I think we can improve on, on that with uh, TC's work. And we'll be uh, figuring out ways to mix colors that you know makes cluster bands show uh, what they are. Anyway, I've used the color scheme pink for the, this giant cluster uh, that shows up uh, right here. Now remember, the idea here is that global labels, okay, the global symmetry labels, they, they kind of live for the outside of the thing and for the inside. These are local. These are things that have to do with the fourfold symmetry that exists on mountaintops, barrier tops uh, for this system. And then the other uh, symmetry, the local C3 uh, labels, they become really good if you're below uh, the, what we call a superatrix curve, right in that region, and you're in the valley. If you're in the valley, okay, uh, you don't have mu as much room as the people in the mountains, so you only get a couple of clusters. And this is just a, a sort of a half of one of these kind of clusters and half of one of these. There's one more T1, E, T2 to go here. T2, E, T1. But then you've got an A1. It sort of doesn't know what it's doing. It just doesn't know who to belong to. It's sort of right on the Severatrix or near it. And then you start seeing the thing uh, show a T1, T2 again, and then an A2, T2, E, T1, T2. is all bound up in very tight near degeneracies. It needs to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And the further you get away from that Severatrix, where it really, if you're living on the top of the mountain, it's kind of like in Arkansas, if you've got a cabin up there, you just stay or you don't go to town very much, right? <laughs> you're isolated, okay? <clears throat> and, but you can get isolated in the city, too, down the valley, right? So <laughs> that's the difference maybe between the anthropomorphic thing. So I really want to make a point between outside or laboratory symmetry reduction, where we're talking about um, these connections again. This is the flip side of symmetry analysis, lab versus body, or state versus particles, really what we're going to be uh, dealing with when we talk the hyperfine structure. But it really boils down to an outside versus an inside. 
And uh, we, we, when we look at the splitting due to, uh, say, an electric field or some sort of perturbation of the molecule from the outside, uh, th that is where we look at the, uh, the splitting uh, in this direction right here. We watch a triplet split and a doublet split into three and two, or just be relabeled into one uh, according to the lower symmetry. Uh, and if you're on the mountaintops, and then there's another one for the valley, similar, okay. But as this gets uh, tighter and tighter, as, as the uh, internal symmetry uh, gets stronger and stronger, as those mountaintops get higher and higher, that's an internal, so you're getting stuck. And that is going to result, uh, this in splitting, this right here is going to be clustering, that is, these are going to be really close together. The A1, T1, and E, you saw how they get uh, really tight. So that's really an important um, thing that I want to measure. So next time, what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at what it takes to diagram the actual waves uh, in one of those clusters and get that two-to-one splitting and all that kind of stuff algebraically. We can't do that with characters. so. Uh, we'll be taking that on. So the message is, when you're doing uh, inside uh, splitting, it's collapsing into a, a, a situation where it is stuck in one place and very unable to communicate uh, with the outside, uh, with the outsiders, what, what it calls outsiders. <laughs> Whereas this, is splitting that we learn in every quantum mechanics text. So we, you, you've gotten in your uh, quantum training so far half the deal. The other half is the inside jobs. And we still don't completely understand that because that's the measurement process. Okay, I'm, I'm quitting now. Uh, here's where C2 becomes important, but uh, that's for another day. Any questions, comments, or? So we'll be going through this in a different way uh, when we use the representations. This is all done with characters so far. Correlation tables and characters. And so you see how um, in group theory you can e excuse somebody who's busy in the lab that they just learned the character theory, right? They've got to build the lasers, right? <laughs> and all that chemistry that goes with it, uh, setting up an experiment, I would be lost uh, doing that. <laughs> it's very difficult stuff. Okay.